Hello. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is James Nuri, and uh, I will be teaching you some history today. So, and that's not a joke. I'm actually going to talk about Yola's history. So, uh, I am the community manager of uh, Yola. It's uh, uh, a com a company uh, based in Finland, and. Uh, Oh, I never realized it's so weird to hear yourself from, through those. <laughs> Anyhow, um, it's a company based in Finland and it got incorporated uh, in, in 2011. So the, the first product uh, hit the market during 2013, uh, by the end of 2013. And um, so we, what we do is that we, we do mobile. Uh, we have uh, Selfish OS, which is our uh, basically gem, I could say. <laughs> uh, we developed Selfish, Selfish OS for, for the world and it is the only uh, independent mobile operating system in the world currently. Um, so, uh, we, we, we started in 2013 by bringing uh, the Yola phone into the market and the reason was that we, we kind of were forced to become our own uh, ODM or vendor, let's say, uh, because no one would take a newbie operating system seriously, no, no like big big vendor would take it seriously. So we had to just implement everything in hardware and uh, bring some innovation <clears throat> to the market using our own power, however we could. Although I'd say we, I wasn't a part of the company back then, I was just a community member, but still, it, it still counts. Uh, we. So the, the company itself uh, was, was founded on the kitchen table of one of the co-founders that actually is, uh, is what, what I've heard through the talks in the company. I wasn't there. Uh, currently we have 50 employees and, and most of them are, are of course from former Nokia uh, teams. Uh, we have, uh, of course, it was in Tampere, Finland that the, uh, the company started. Tammerfors, if you are from Sweden. The, word, the, the name differs a little bit. Um, so the, the, the first office, the first official office of the company was in Tampere, Finland. Uh, and then, then we have currently office of headquarters in Tampere, Helsinki and, uh, and Hong Kong at the same time. Uh, the, the, the people who were working on, on the MIMO and MIGO uh, operating systems from Nokia, which were Linux-based uh, operating systems, moves over to Yola, I mean most of them move over to Yola and uh, basically continued the legacy of Migo and uh, brought safety shows to the world. So far we have 75 million US dollars invested on uh, to safety shows and that's basically, I could say it's not a lot of money for a full operating system if you, if you think about like what a company has to go through to productize an operating system and basically bring it up to up to the standards of the world. Um, with, with our new new strategy, uh, we have we have three licenses, uh, regional licenses now in in uh, uh, Russia, China, and Latin Americas, and we are expanding, of course. Um, so I, I will go actually into details about the strategic licenses a little bit later. But this is actually, actually also a fun fact here that we have 10,000 plus international uh, media articles written about either rollouts or selfish or both. Or it's just a cool, cool thing to know for me as well. <laughs> now, um, how do we do it? Like, how how do 50 people bring an operating and mobile operating system to the world? That's not not an easy. Not easy. It's, it's actually a tall order if you think about it. But it's the, it's the community, and uh, it's the heart of Yola. We have said that from the beginning. Uh, but where did this community come from? It was from the Nokia days, of course. Because there wasn't, like, Yola didn't exist, and nobody knew about it. And when we, when, they, when we started the company, of course, nobody would know about us either, because how would we pick up? I mean, between all the Samsungs and Apples and whatever, how would, how would a company made out of a few people pick up media articles, it would not work and nobody would know about us. So it was the community from the, the Nokia days that, that has moved over to Yola alongside with the employees um, and, and continued the journey with us. And now it's even bigger than before, it's even more awesome than before. Um, 
Of course, the community manager would say that. I mean, I do want to keep my job, but after all, so. <laughs> but uh, it's really we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the community. So, what does the community do? What does the community do for us? It's media coverage, of course. There are different uh, blogs in different languages in different parts of the world that uh, frequently write about us and the news that come off, uh, of the company. Of course, the, the authors of those uh, blogs are community members and they have like, direct contact with me most of the time and they, they know uh, what's going to happen and what is happening already. And we, we have the word of mouth. So when you don't have billions of dollars to put on, a, uh, on your marketing budget, like other companies do, you basically have no chance of surviving in, in the same area. Like if, if a company is putting, let's say, a billion dollar, and you're putting a few thousand, even a few tens of thousands, you have basically no chance. So you will use a free service called word of mouth. And that's basically what happens by the kindness of our community. Uh, most of them are Linux enthusiasts. Uh, their friends and family, they know who they are, they know what they talk about. So, so it's not strange when they go to their family and they, or, or friends or whoever, and they start talking about, hey, look at this cool phone I have, look at this cool operating system, whatever. It's really fine, and people listen to them and get to know what Yola and Selfish is. Um, and, well, it goes forward like that. Of course, they, they, they help us in social activities, like uh, an example that happened recently, we were in Mobile World Congress. Every year, there are uh, a couple of community members, or more than a couple maybe, uh, follow us there. They help us with the demos. I myself was a community member at some point before I got hired, and I, I followed to these events and helped, helped out with showing the devices to people and uh, letting them know what Yola and Selfish is about, bringing, bringing them to the booth, uh, basically introducing them to the engineers so that they could get deep into the, the world of Selfish. And of course, as I mentioned already, general awesomeness is the, is the community's uh, biggest asset here. <laughs> Uh, if I want to go into more details of what the community actually does for us in terms of their con contribution, not the, the media coverage and stuff, uh, we, we should start with the, with the community testing. So we have different groups that uh, receive uh, uh, release candidates for different releases of our operating system, different updates of our operating system, and they basically catch the stuff that we may have missed. They report bugs, uh, they, they do different testing scenarios for us on, on everyday usage that we basically, it's, it's possible, we're only 50 people and we don't, like out of those 50 people, not everybody is a tester. So you definitely can miss something and, and the community definitely helps us a lot with, the, with that. We have porters, so uh, we do have a hardware adaptation team, but again, out of that 50 people, and again, I mentioned that again, it's coming a little bit redundant, but out of that 50 people, we have a small team of uh, hardware adaptation team and those they, they don't have the time and resources or anything to just get 50 devices in hand and just start porting selfish OS so that doesn't work like that so again the community comes in they get a device uh, maybe they have a, an old device lying around or something in that regards and they just port selfish OS to it of course it's not going to have all the features but uh, that's not that's not the case. The case, the, the, the point here is that they port Selfish OS and if you, as a person who don't know what Selfish OS is, who hasn't tested it before, maybe you have an old phone lying around, you can maybe Google your phone model and see if, the, if there's a community port for it or not, and just freely just install and test and see if Selfish OS is for you or not. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing. And we, we of course have, have translation, uh, translations happening. So so we have community members of course from different parts of the world, and they know different languages. Uh, so we have a poodle, and we put the operating system strings uh, for the new updates that are coming on those on that poodle, and everybody just comes there, translate everything to their own language, and leaves. It's just it's so fast, so intuitive, and amazing that. I, I don't know, like, is I love the community. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, then, of course, we have the applications. Uh, we have over 1,000 applications currently on our store. Of course, if you compare it to the, to the big players, it's not that much, but then again, you have to imagine our uh, level of uh, involvement with people uh, and, and how many people actually use our operating system compared to, to those. So, 1,000 apps, well, over 1,000 apps, actually. That's uh, really impressive, and also we have this is only on our official store. Then there's another store driven by the community. It's called Open Repos. O Open Repository is a repository of applications uh, that are written by the community that are not on the store. Uh, maybe they're coming later on the store, but anyway, you can go and download over there. Uh, I don't have an exact number for that, but those are quite a lot too, because Open Repos is actually older than you all itself. It was. Uh, it was a repository for, for Nokia, uh, my, my Migo applications, but nowadays it's being used for, <coughs> for Selfish. And then, of course, we have uh, dif different various, various open source con contributions on, on Mare and Selfish OS, uh, and of course, a lot of upstream op open source uh, projects based on that as well. Uh, then we have this forum type website called together.yola.com. And that is also, uh, of course, we are, we, we are available there, we read, we respond, etc. But it's mostly community driven, and a lot of community people help each other over there uh, and uh, find solutions to the, to the potential problems that, that they have, uh, which is also very lovely. Now, we go back a little bit uh, to what happened. Why Yola? Why not just you know we'll continue with the Nokia things? Well, as you can see, uh, this picture is actually from talk.mymo.org. Some people might know what I'm talking about. Um, so there was this Migo and, and Mymo that I talked about. So this Migo was called was dubbed the burning platform in Nokia for some reason. And a lot of people found it unreasonable, but hey, it got killed off. And uh, and Yola. The word YOLA, uh, in case you live in Sweden and you know Swedish, is the same word as YOLE, which is a small boat that it kind of rescues you from such a situation. And, and if I go to the next slide, with my very poor Photoshop skills, I have, I mean, it's right there. It's, it's running away, and it's not even the right boat. It should be very much smaller, but I couldn't find a PNG that, that could work there, so. I'm not, I'm not sorry? Yeah, the dingy, yes, yes. That good one, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, they, uh, there should be people in there, and they use that, that dingy to, to uh, run away from the, from the fire, and they basically made this company. So why an alternative OS? That's an important question, because <laughs> I, get, I get asked all the time, you know, why, would, why would I use Selfish OS? Like this, this uh, uh, previous presenter, I forgot her name, sorry, but she was saying, why would I use Opera? Uh, people are like, asking here. It's the same thing, why would I use Selfish OS when there's Android, when there's, Opera, uh, when there's uh, iOS operating systems? Well, first of all, we are on a different philosophy of uh, operating systems, I could say. So, I'm going to bring up an example of cars. Um, imagine if the whole world was having just one car brand and like it was only Ford or it was only Mercedes. That would not be fun, would it? There, there was no competition, there was no... I mean, they used the same combustion engine or maybe electrified or, or maybe hybrid, whatever. They use the same systems. They get you from A to B. But they're different brands, you like them for what they are. And this is basically the same story. But we are bringing a different philosophy here. We. Our biggest selling point here is that we don't collect or sell your data. And that's very important because Android, for example, is based on, I mean, is, is alive on collecting and selling your data. They monetize whatever you have on your phone. And a lot of people don't want that. And we respect that. And we don't want that. So, we bring this into the market, we promise you that we don't collect any data. The only thing that we want from you is your email address for your email accounts, and you, you may just give us any old email address that you don't even care about. So, it's fine. <laughs> we don't need any data from you. Then, the other aspect is 
a different user, a more modern user interface and user experience. So the UX philosophy behind Yola and Selfish OS is, is that well, how we design the operating system here is that we, you don't need to move your thumb that much from the screen. I should maybe actually hold on, hold on to the device right here. It's much better like that. There we go. So you don't need to, you don't need to move your thumb from this corner of the screen that much because everything can be done by gestures. So you, you are inside an application. You want to, I'm not sure if anybody can see this, but anyway, you want to move to the, back to the home screen, you just swipe the application away. You want to go to the app drawer, you just swipe upwards like that. You want to go to your notifications, you just swipe this way. Everything is based on gestures. You want to, uh, I don't know, grab, uh, find out about the options that are in the application. You see there's a line up there and you just swipe downwards and you see the options. And you don't even have to click on them, you just release your finger and it selects for you by haptic feedback. So, even like thinking about it health-wise, your thumb will be healthier. It's important, you'll have them, it's very important. Try, try working with a tablet, Android tablet, your thumb will hurt after two hours. And that's definitely not good for, I'm not a doctor, but the, the, the stuff inside here. So, <laughs> that, uh, that's another big differentiator here. And of course, it's, we, we're trying to challenge the Android situation. It's not good to, to have a duopoly of operating systems, as I mentioned at the beginning as well. Now, the path of Selfish OS, uh, so, then again, I'm uh, kind of repeating myself here, but since I'm uh, transitioning to Vesco after this slide, I need to uh, remind you of what I've said. So it started from Migo and Nokia. They were so Migo was a joint uh, uh, joint forces between Intel and Nokia, and they put a lot of resources and a lot of money. I mean, it's Intel and it's Nokia, the two huge companies. They put a lot of resources, and a lot of money, and a lot of uh, uh, investment into the operating system, they developed it, uh, and they just abandoned it, for whatever reason. Um, then, people who saw the, the, the uh, potential that was uh, within that operating system continued the legacy of it, brought this uh, Selfish OS 1.0, which, which started as a Selfish OS beta, uh, into the market on those devices, on the Yola phone, Yola tablets, and then, we changed our strategy to sell Selfish OS. When we released the Selfish OS 2.0, we changed our strategy. We, uh, we started licensing the software to different vendors. And we, had a, we had different vendors in India and other countries that uh, install Selfish OS, pre installed Selfish OS on their devices. And now we have Selfish 3 and also Selfish X, um, which you will hear about later, of course. Um, and also we have the uh, um, strategy of regional ecosystems that I talked about a little bit in the beginning. So we are making the operating system available regionally through, uh, I mean, based on what your country needs, based on the, the, the needs of those people, we're releasing it into your country. Like, as I said, for example, now it's China and Russia and uh, South America, Latin America. So that was my part. I am now going to transition to Vesco. Uh, in order to continue the presentation. All right. So, as we started out with the regional licensing strategy, we had a challenge. And the challenge was roughly that there are no devices available for our community. The original devices we did was back in 2013, 2015, they were aging. Uh, the, the licenses that we had those devices were available in some markets, but not in the markets where our community mostly was. As we are a European-based company, of course, most of the community is in Europe, even though there are uh, significant community parts elsewhere. But uh, this is like the home community was without uh, up-to-date hardware. Uh, so we wanted to provide an answer to that question that how do community get an up-to-date hardware and self is always on that hardware with a reasonable price 
and reasonable research and development effort, since we did not want to go back to making our own devices. Making our own devices is, we have seen it, it's very, very costly, it's very, very risky, and uh, we had our ups and downs, and we took a long time to find this regional licensing strategy that is able to uh, pull enough money to the company's income. So, uh, we chose this approach that let's develop an aftermarket operating system for an existing device. So basically you go to the shop, buy a device, and then you will be able to flash selfies on it. This re removes the cost of developing the hardware, this removes the risk in the hardware development project. We just need to do the, the porting work of the operating system. We need to have a, some way of providing the image for the users, so develop a shop. Then we need to provide install instructions and ideally make the install as easy as possible. For the vendor, we need to have a vendor that supports this kind of activity. Of course, most phone manufacturers would like to use their operating system as is. And, and that's a problem. There are a couple of nice ones that allow unlocking the bootloader and hacking a custom Android on it. And, and that's also a way for an alternative OS, like Selfies OS, onto the device. And then thirdly, we already saw the value of the community in James's part. It's huge. And of course, in this activity, we wanted to work with the community as much as possible. It makes the possibility of success much higher. And of course, then when you've been involved in developing it, you're much more committed to, to actually getting the device. And, and. The product is called Selfies X. Uh, this is the marketing slide for it. So we, we put it for the Xperia X, uh, the, the operating system first, and made it available uh, last year. And how it works is that, that there is like this three-way collaboration going on. So firstly, Sony has a program called the Open Devices program, where they have a set of their devices supported. Uh, they have the uh, instructions for the users to unlock the bootloader in a, in a controlled manner. You, you kind of need to accept certain ser terms and services and be aware of practical implications because it's no, no longer a kind of product after you unlock the bootloader and, and install a custom OS on it. Additionally, Sony also releases an Android open source project based image for these devices. So, so there is a working baseline Android where we know that this and that feature is working. Then we have uh, the, the community around Ayola. Of course, it's, it's uh, Linux, Qt. Uh, it's pretty much technically like white normal Linux distribution, except that it's for a mobile phone and then has this uh, touch-friendly UI. And thirdly, there's us, the company, to making it productized, having it tested, uh, making sure that this and that feature works, and uh, some of the parts that we have licensed from the you know, third parties, uh, that those are available. So we started this, uh, we announced it in 2017 at Mobile World Conference, where we had the first demo of, uh, of uh, uh, running on the Xperia X product. Uh, already for that first demo, we had handpicked a couple of uh, community members that we knew from the hardware adaptation community that, that uh, hey, take a look, we have this kind of activity going, do you want to help us? In, in, in making a port for the Xperia X device and the guys were really, really enthusiastic. I mean, we had a 
one of those community guys in our uh, Airbnb during the conference fixing bugs last night, like uh, until early in the morning to make the demo something that that 100,000 attendees of Mobile World Conference can actually have in their hands and make their YouTube videos and, and everything. So uh, that was an interesting start for the project. Then during the summer we started to materialize the actual port, uh, setting up a shop and, uh, and a way to, to actually deploy uh, or, or distribute the image. Uh, was, was one of the challenges that also took a little bit longer than we anticipated. Uh, we hired the community guy who was helping us since he turned out to be such, such an awesome, awesome guy and he did a lot of the, uh, the trickiest uh, hardware adaptation part of, of the whole porting process. Uh, and then also we, at that point we also opened the hardware adaptation sources and that was a little bit trickier than we thought. So when you start on some track, it's always difficult in the mid project to change because that's many people contributing and you don't want to, you, you always feel that you are in that critical moment that, hey, we are shipping next week or next, next week. And let's not make anything big changes. But uh, anyway, we did it in the summer and uh, getting more, more possibility from the community. And also that helped the community members to uh, make ports to uh, related devices, not exactly Xperia X. So there is the X Compact, which is uh, quite clear, quite near, and there is the dual SIM version, which is also quite near. So those co those projects started already when we pushed out the adaptation sources. Then finally, in October, after the final push, you were able to start the, the sales and have the, everything in place so the OS was working, the shop was available, install instructions were... Hmm, what's the kind of word for it? Well, we had install instructions. <laughs> so somebody in this room has... <laughs> uh, uh, so and, uh, in our like uh, development philosophy, Providing software updates is somehow in our DNA. So uh, in November was the first software update for 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 this one. It was uh, it was some bug fixes mainly. Uh, then in this year, we we demonstrated the follow up device. So this is uh, Xperia XA2, and uh, it's a new model from Sony. So it was announced just January, and then we had the the selfies booting up at the Mobile World Conference already and we will be providing this to the market well, basically as soon as we have it ready. Uh, then we did the second software update now on, on March and we are working on the third update which we are providing uh, uh, hopefully in May and there we will bring support for dual SIM variant of the device uh, we have enabled the fingerprint support of the device and uh, finally we want to make the install a bit more easier by having a graphical installation wizard. It's still going to have several steps because of the, the way you unlock the bootloader and then do this and that, but the wizard should be guiding you much better than just the website instructions. So, in practice, how it works for a user, you can buy the Xperia X from any shop. And you go to the Sony website for the unlock instructions. They give, will give you a like, device-specific unlock code, uh, which you need to use certain tool to input to the device. Then the bootloader is unlocked, and then you can uh, purchase the service OS, download it, and then flash the device. So, if you know what you are doing in under half an hour, you are done. But uh, unfortunately, for most, it might take a little bit more than that. And uh, what was cool is that Linux was the, the easiest one to do it, and Windows was the most difficult. <laughs> How did we succeed? Uh, well, the effort required 
was uh, about half of our usual porting pro porting efforts and uh, there's of course like a couple of things that contributed this one firstly I think the community involvement helped help us a lot and then we were um, realistic in our target setting so we did something that that uh, sounds kind of a bad but we did uh, so for example Bluetooth we just said that there will not be Bluetooth in the beginning and uh, it was not officially supported uh, some features did work already on the first release but uh, it's much easier when you you don't set like some specific level of, of uh, compatibility you just say that no it's not supported then it's a positive surprise if your hands free works instead of negative uh, that your car audio doesn't work or something like that so we did a couple of those hard choices which, which also uh, kind of uh, explain how it was so significantly lower effort than, than usual we also met the sales targets and again there we wanted to be realistic as well that this release is really for the selfish hobbyists the, the, the Linux people the open source people, the kind of people that are technically uh, very capable and, and has the patience to do something a little bit scary and a little bit tricky but uh, still I think we reached the group quite well we have got the nice public feedback you can see the couple of tweets here on screenshots of the also readable yes uh, in addition to, to individuals, we have had a couple of journalists test driving the, the release and written nice articles about the, the situation. I mean, or reporting both good and bad, quite honestly. Even the, the biggest technology magazine in Finland called Technica Malm had an article about it and uh, they complained about the install process, but other than that, the feedback was very good. <coughs> and, uh, uh, of course, there's this additional benefit of, of having a device that is so easily available from a mass market uh, vendor that when we have these business-to-business -business discussions, we can always say to those companies that are interested that if you want easy way to try, go and buy this, follow these instructions and you have device on your hands. We don't need to ship any prototypes, we don't need to rely on uh, on uh, video conferences or Facebooks or expensive travels for these first experiences. So in fact this has been such a positive uh, program that we are following up. Uh, I showed you the, the XA2 device so we will follow up with and uh, that's largely based on uh, you know how, how successful the first uh, Xperia experience has been for us. So, what did we learn? Well, we learned that the good open source collaboration partners are vital. Uh, so the Sony's Open Devices program provided technically very good uh, baseline for our efforts. And in addition, we had some like talks with the, the engineers involved in that program, and they were, you know, happy to help us in sorting out this and that uh, technical challenges. So. That, that's, that's something that was definitely needed for this I working with other vendors would have been much much more difficult similarly the target setting did need to be very realistic that, that we cannot just say that everything will work from day one but instead we keep shipping the features when uh, the time is good for us like the, the fingerprint that's coming now in the next month and uh, if you are if you have been as patient as a user, you will get these little treats as a software update. Uh, the community has been a huge value all the way through the, to the program. Uh, then there have been some challenges. Uh, I already mentioned about the hardware adaptation shortages. That was a little bit tricky to change it in the mid project to productize it well enough to, to open it up. But I think in the XA2 we'll be able to do it much, much quicker. Uh, we had some last-minute changes. 
so for example, we did the installation method. We, I think, two weeks before the shop opened, we thought we, that only way we can install is Linux. One week before, we thought that only way we can install is Windows. And and then during you know the last day, we understood that we can support Windows, Mac, and Linux, which was our target from the beginning. Uh, keeping focus in delivering what was promised. I think this is a generic lesson, but it's always been like this: that uh, that uh, it's easy to go to do the nice and easy things, but you need to pay attention that what have you actually promised to ship, because keeping the promises is really what matters. And uh, sometimes it's too fun. We have paid customer projects. So customer pays us, fix this, improve this, implement this. And then we have this nice, our own device. Our community loves these devices. So as an engineer, which do you prefer? So sometimes it just grabs a little bit too much time. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still quite happy that uh, I think we have met, like, been able to balance the, the internal uh, fun project with the customer project that pays the daily bills. All right, so that was the safe is X. Uh, it's been fun so far. The next step is uh, uh, safe is free. So this is what we work on this year. Is the latest version of the Selfies operating system. It will bring us new form factors, uh, new UX fixes, and uh, more security and privacy. What you see here is, uh, is the XA2. Uh, then you see a demo of the feature phone. Uh, so this is a proof of how the UI scales from tablets to smartphones to feature phones and we even had a smartwatch demo uh, last year. And uh, then we have this uh, landscape device, this is a Gemini PDA, PDA running a selfies demo here, so we have a support for full QWERTY landscape device. Uh, then under the hood, it's a lot of things are, are related to the technology how we build this. So what we do is uh, update some key components on the stack. Qt is what we use for the UI development and we are going to upgrade it to 5.9. It's a long term support release and that's why we prefer it over the newer 5.10. Then we are going to upgrade the Android support version. So we have a sandbox for running the Android applications on the OS, but uh, it has been uh, based on 4.4.4, uh, so quite ancient uh, Android uh, baseline or API, and we are upgrading it uh, this year. And from these software upgrades, mostly from the Qt upgrade and uh, the improvements in QML, we are going to get some performance improvement. Then we have a bunch of new APIs. Uh, a lot of those come from the Qt itself, but then there are some, some uh, APIs that we have developed for privacy and security related to VPN and cryptography libraries and, and uh, uh, secrets. Uh, then the cloud integration is improving. So our approach to cloud is, is like James said, that we don't collect your data. We are not hosting any, any cloud, but, uh, but uh, we have plugins for various popular cloud providers like uh, Dropbox, uh, OneCloud, and, uh, and, and others. And we are going to just uh, build in system functionality to synchronize your info to those clouds. And, and it's going to be plugin based so that if you can write your own uh, cloud plugin, then we are happy to synchronize to your cloud as well. Uh, security, we are more working more and more with, uh, with uh, corporate and government markets, so having encrypted data and communications 
uh, things like device management for corporations, uh, like remote lock and uh, wipe, these kind of things on the security area. Uh, and then on the connectivity, uh, what's like up-to-date connectivity methods like uh, Volti, Bluetooth, LE, USB on the go. On the user experience, we are going to have a couple of the uh, improvements to the core UX that are often requested and we believe that makes the gesture-based UX even more handy. Uh, and uh, like I showed, we also have the uh, new device categories, the feature phone, the, the landscape QWERTY phone and uh, uh, low-spec hardware. The, the gestures uh, are mostly around improving the multitasking experience, like the, the having the way to quickly switch be between apps, uh, the top menu redesign, so that it's uh, easier to access the shortcuts for, for settings that are mostly used. And then lastly, we have the new visual style. So, uh, we are calling it inverted ambience at the moment, but the idea is that the UI has been uh, uh, white text on a dark background, and that's not very good in the direct sunlight or uh, sunny, sunny summer days. So you could uh, then uh, have this inverse, inverted ambience where you have a black text and a light background. And uh, one of the biggest changes really is this uh, support for the feature phones. So we have added the, the keypad navigation for the UI. Uh, the concept of safety is always have been mapped quite nicely on the, on the uh, keypad. Of course we need to drop some features, we need to drop things like multitasking that of course you are running out of memory you cannot multitask. And if you want to reach even further uh, down the, down the memory budget, so you might need to drop the browser as well. But if you have just a little bit of memory, and just enough, then you can also run selected Android apps, maybe one or two on your feature phone, like uh, uh, WhatsApp, so you can navigate with the keypad and just use it on your feature phone. So, that was what I had to say about safety is free. Uh, we are here, we have a stand there, so if you want to touch our devices, see the feature phone demo, just come and visit us on our stand. It's a swag. And we have some swag as well. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, we have a community meetup today at 17.30 at some place, but come to talk to us if you, are, if you want to attend. <laughs> All right, any questions? I hope you're also giving away phones and swag. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any questions? Oh. Hi, uh, two quick questions. Um, how do you compare in, with uh, AUSB? in regard to your governance model. So even if Android is open source, they, it gets developed behind closed doors. Uh, so changes or requests by the community get upstreamed in an indefinite time, you don't know. And uh, the second question, if I may, um, when, when, when I go to your website and I pay and I buy, what do I buy? Do I buy a compiled uh, image that I can compile myself? Or is that specific image for the Xperia phone not available online? So, two questions. Governance model and uh, what do I buy? Yeah, so the governance model, uh, well, simply speaking, we, we use uh, the repositories openly. So, the service OS is, is not fully open source, sorry, but uh, the UI level has some closed packages. But the, 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 like I said, the hardware adaptation, the middleware, uh, that, that, uh, well, on this project, both are, both are open source, and we, we use the, the repositories as they are in the public. So it's not like the code drop every, every, 
now and then. But if there is a fix, it will be in the repository. Uh, we have a, a MERP actual for 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 uh, the MERP project, which is the open source part to file file issues there. And similarly, we have the together.chola.com forum that James was mentioning, where you can have a like a this kind of a requests that can you guys do this kind of feature and that kind of feature and uh, we, we try to follow it up but uh, of course the volume of input is, is huge so cannot always guarantee a response to these, these requests and uh, what was the second part? <laughs> what do I buy? Uh, uh, okay. Just one moment But I, I think you partly answered by saying it's not completely open source, but please feel free to... Ah, yeah, yeah. So with the, with the, license, uh, with the license, you get a downloadable image, and that you can just flash on your device, and in fact you can flash that to as many devices as you want, but there are some certain commercial components that you need to download for the, from the YOLA store, and that's tied to your account. So you can have that only on one device. So, for example, the, the Android runtime uh, is, is that kind of a key component that you can only have on, on, on one device. Uh, so about the Android runtime, uh, as far as I understand, it's based on Anbox. Uh, why it's not? Either way, uh, why, uh, uh, why whatever solution you've looked into or you've selected, and uh, have you looked into the uh, Chromium OS solution? Uh, it's not based on Unbox. It's a, it's a, it's a originally developed by a company called uh, Myriad in uh, in uh, in uh, China, and uh, uh, but we, we have uh, acquired you know, necessary licensing rights for it, and we are maintaining it now on, on our own, and. Uh, it has worked well so far, so we haven't taken a look at the uh, alternatives for it. So there's of course uh, getting an Android app running and uh, is, is somehow doable with a reasonable effort, but when you want to bind it well to the user experience and integrate it into the OS and in a controlled way, then there's all sort of a, a binding that you need to consider that. And how do you share images? from this side of the OS to the others, how do you do this and that. So once we have all those issues sorted out, and one of the biggest was to maybe the window management of the Android apps. As you know, we have a multitasking view with, with live, live previews of the Android apps. So when, once we have that working and, and the issues sorted out mostly, then the changing would just, even though there technically might be something uh, that would be maybe easier to maintain in the long run. We have not had time and resources to, to make any, any kind of change. Yeah, um, it's uh, just because I've been using ZF uh first version and second version versions. And uh, one thing that back then was a problem, and I don't know if it's still the case today, was that I was a Qt developer, I was seeing bugs on my phone and the apps were actually closed source. Uh, is it still the case today? And if so, why is it still cloud closed source? So the situation is, all, is pretty much the same. Browser is open source. Uh, Documents viewer is, is open source. And uh, the reason is simply the, the investors. So it's somehow in the in the uh, company structure that uh, for the new software or, or that uh, that uh, if we change the ownership of the developed uh, assets, we need the approval from company board, and uh, those are investors and their representatives, and they are very very careful. And when we have had the financial challenges during the, the past couple of years, unfortunately the arguments for opening up more have not been uh, able to stick well enough in that situation. 
and uh, it is still in the kind of a company DNA that we want to do it, go forward with it, and uh, exactly the apps uh, is something that where we want, where we think that it's easiest to start because there shouldn't be that much risk in opening up sources of calculator application, notes application, uh, this and that application. Uh, so, so that would be that would be a start or showing some progress in it. I have a bit of a sad question. Uh, you depend on other people's hardware. If they decide to shut down, if Sony decide to shut down licensing, and with what I left, I buy Xperia today. I buy Selfish, but tomorrow, the idea of Xperia being back, like bootloading, opening, is done. There is nothing more. What is left for me? Well, of course, your device will continue working, so they cannot shut it down after you have installed it selfies on it. You just cannot have the, the next device from Sony. Uh, we cannot guarantee that, that there will continue to be these kind of manufacturers there, but, but at the moment there still are many manufacturers that I like to keep the, the bootloader open. Uh, of course, if the company is uh, strong enough financially, then we can consider doing our own devices again. But I think more natural is that, that, uh, that while the business is getting better, the, the licensees will see opportunity also in Europe to bring their devices available in, in European Union markets as well. Uh, in, in addition to their, their home markets. Do we have any more questions? So I guess uh, there's no questions left. And Sorry. I guess it's one more round of applause for Bessa Matin James.